Hey everyone, my name is Stephen Roberts and I'm a professor here in the psychology department at Stanford University. Um, I'm talking to you at a moment, intense moment in our nation's history. If you turn on the television, you'll see that the racial tensions and divisions that have defined our country since its inception continue to define it today. And I want to here take a, 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 a short minute of your time to explain to you from a psychological perspective how American racism comes to be. Specifically, I want to go over seven factors. These are not all the factors, but these are seven big ones. The first, American categories. From birth, we learn to categorize or put people into different groups, different categories, and there's a lot of research showing that once people are placed into those categories, once we put people in those categories, we tend to believe that they're all members of a category are alike. We tend to make inferences about people simply on the basis of those categories, um, and that gives rise to things like stereotyping um, and, and later on more intense racist beliefs. American factions, a second one. Um, not only do we think about about these categories, but we are also embedded within those categories. Um, we belong or identify with these groups, and there's a lot of work showing that we tend to treat our own group uh, more positively than we treat out groups. Um, we tend to trust our in-group members. We want to cooperate with our in-group members uh, in ways that we don't necessarily want to do with um, out-group members. Third, American segregation. So we put people into these categories, we're in these categories, and the United States systematically segregates people on the basis of those categories. A lot of policies that make sure that that um, segregation remains in place. And there's a lot of work showing that, it, well, if you deny people the opportunity to interact with people of a different racial group, um, you're going to you know, have a pretty rigid or basic understanding or beliefs about how those, how those groups, in fact, are. But if people come together, um, more diverse groups, that gives people the opportunity to challenge any racist stereotypes that they may or may not um, have. Fourth, American hierarchy. So not only is are these racial groups, you know, segregated, they're also hierarchically ordered. And there's a long um, history in the, in the United States by which white Americans tend to be um, have higher status than Americans of color. I'll give you one quick example. As of today, 2020, um, about 98% of U.S. presidents have been white. So there's a clear a clear hierarchy. And that has consequences for who we believe should be in these high status positions um, and who we believe should be in those lower status positions. Fifth, American power. So not only are, is the United States hierarchically ordered, but those at the top of the hierarchy are in a powerful position from which to you know, transmit their beliefs onto people down below them, and also in a position to sh shape policies, shape norms, um, shape, shape law. And this is not only in terms of you know the president of the United States, but we can also think of power at a smaller level, like parents. Right? Parents are in a in a position to transfer um, racist beliefs or anti-racist beliefs to their children. And there's a lot of research showing that you know if someone at the top of a hierarchy, a powerful person, has some kind of racist belief, which they likely do, given the nation that it may you know, transfer over to people um, who, they, who they have power over. Sixth, American media. There's a long body of work showing how the media distort certain categories, how white Americans tend to be presented as the most innocent, the most divine, the most beautiful, and people of color tend to, to not be given those, those portrayals or those images. Native Americans, for instance, are really portrayed as historical outdated figures, as um, warrior princesses or chiefs who are portrayed as if they were not a, a component of contemporary um, society. And that, you know, transmits across U.S. citizens this, these distorted images of how human beings actually are in the real world. And seventh, American pacifism, which I think may be one of the most insidious forms of racism, such that we have all these factors in place that make racism essentially inevitable in U.S. society. And with those things in place, we often don't really do much about it. We kind of just let that sit and we passively allow these systems to remain in place. And for that reason, I think what's probably most important 
more important than understanding what makes someone racist. We know a lot of work about how that comes to be. I think what's probably even more important is understanding, well, what makes someone anti-racist? And we like to think of, you know, people who are reactively anti-racist who, you know, given the recent horrific um, tragedies, who will react to an instance and become anti-racist in response to that, challenging racial hierarchy, challenging racial inequality. We also want to think about ways to be proactively anti-racist. Before something happens, what are you doing in your, in your life right now to challenge racial hierarchy going forward? How future-oriented are you? And I think that's something that's unfortunately less common, but this is, I think, a, a great moment for us all to sit back and reflect, well, why is it um, so uncommon and how can we make it the norm going forward?